right super so uh first of all uh, a nice welcome to tori robinson from the uk hi tori how are you doing today i'm doing well thanks yeah yeah enjoying the sunshine how are you doing i'm also doing very well uh belgium is blessing us with blue sky and 28 degrees so it's really the summer has come at least for now yeah. um to our uh, viewers and followers um this is actually our second video uh, about epilepsy daily life um so do remember to subscribe uh so that you will be getting these videos in your inbox um but today uh, we have tori robinson with us from the uk um tori is uh one of our affiliate marketing partners she's based in the uk uh, she's the ceo and co-founder of epilepsy sparks and we are very very curious to uh share with our community um tori's story but maybe first of all tori uh why won't you tell tell a little bit about yourself who's who's tori and yeah what are you doing uh, at the moment except from sitting inside of course uh, with with the pandemic um also just first of all i'm just like the founder of epilepsy sparks just so you know rather than co-founder um but this came apart um came apart came too <laughs> because um i started getting really frustrated with general humans just not being um at all aware of what epilepsy involved um i had recently had a temporal surgery for my own epilepsy and i started a blog um which was really just for people that i knew because it was quite blunt <laughs> and um it wasn't necessarily for the whole world to see at that time but it really took off um and so it ended up becoming epilepsy sparks well it was just like a really skanky like quickly put together blog and it just kind of over i don't know a, a few months just blew up and um and then i decided because i love science i love research i love credible information i love things um that are declared uh, based upon credible research and empirical evidence mm -hmm. um and it's when we have factual information like that that we can start with confidence talking to other people about things like epilepsy say so, okay you know what let me declare this because that is based on such and such, which was done in a lab or with, you know, etc. Um, and so now, like, for instance, we have a page just on labs because I just think that they're so cool. Um, <laughs> um, we've even got a page on SUDEP because sudden unexpected death by epilepsy, again, is something that is rarely spoken about unless a celebrity dies of it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it could happen to me today, but I've done and I'm doing everything I can to minimize my risk. And I think that's what lots of people can also do. So let's have something out there about it. And then, that's, sorry. That's really amazing. And, and for everyone who is watching, um, there is a website, epilepsy, epilepsysparks.com, right? Yes. Uh, where will be able to find uh, find all about this um so all this nice content on epilepsy based on indeed on empirical uh evidence and papers uh addition to these uh labs and the research which is ongoing um you yourself have epilepsy um and i also know since i know you for a while that you've been undergoing surgery right so i did have surgery back in 2013 yes and for those of our um, people in the community, uh, the epilepsy community in the general, um, this kind of, of yeah, um, element, surgery uh, for epilepsy, is something that some of them have to come true. Uh, not only is there some uh, period in prior to, and, and of course, the, the, the surgery itself, but there also comes a time after it. Um, yeah. Can you maybe tell a bit about your personal experience, experiment, uh, and also maybe, I assume you had a epilepsy diagnosis and that surgery mm -hmm. was, yeah, something down the road after some 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 time. Yeah, sure. So um, I was diagnosed when I was ten with epilepsy, although I had a seizures years prior to that, which I remember, um, and my epilepsy got worse and worse 
over time, um, I actually moved back from Australia. We were talking about Australia earlier, but um, I moved back because my epilepsy got so bad. Um, and I basically, my life expectancy wasn't great because I was having accidents. My risk of SUDEP was getting you know, higher and higher. And so when my neurologist said to me, but he said all this bluntly, which I love him for. Was, he actually made me laugh. Um, and he said, would you consider surgery? And I'm like, yeah, sure, because I knew I was going to kind of die anyway. Um, and I also um, experienced mental health issues too. So I was very depressed and I was like, sure, whatever. And because I'd read quite a lot about um, surgeries and um, not this one in particular, but I was just very interested in medicine and science, I was very confident in all the work up to the surgery. So, of course, I would have a multiple scans, video telemetry. Um, luckily, I didn't need intracranial EEG. Like, they didn't have to go and didn't have to have surgery with the electrodes on my brain because mm. my uh, regular EEG and video telemetry was like, dude, this is the dodgy part of your brain. It was very obvious. <laughs> um, and, yeah, uh, what else? Uh, of course, had... Um, uh, neuropsychiatric evaluation. Um, uh, I'm, I'm lucky I was able to sort of speak for myself. Lots of people can, but we have lots of people, for instance, with intellectual disability who aren't able to make these choices on their own. So it really varies. The process varies for lots of different people. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I had my surgery. Um, I was excited when I was having it. I was like, just rip this thing out, mate. Like, because I knew what would or was likely to happen otherwise, right? And it was just so exciting to me. Um, I actually asked um, my neurologist if they could video it, but because it was a last minute um, uh, surgery, they didn't have time to arrange it at that time. Anyway, um, after surgery was much more difficult than prior for me. Mm -hmm. My, as I mentioned, my mental health was poor prior. Afterwards, it just got so bad and I ended up in psychiatric hospital but look I don't want people to think this happens to everyone it really doesn't and it's very important for everyone to ask questions about their particular surgery because this was my left temporal lobe which had certain sclerosis going around corners and stuff they couldn't remove all of the damaged brain tissue although they took out much of it um it is each of our brains is so so unique so for instance i'll get people asking me questions about um having surgery on one of their frontal lobes and that it's a completely different story right it's so different even if you have for instance surgery on your left temporal lobe it's different to that on your right mm -hmm. because each is although they do similar jobs they are different and might have different um impacts on certain functions and yeah so um but for me the most impactful thing it straight after surgery was mental health which went down that's also something that uh so the mental health side of epilepsy um is something that you really have been yeah bringing up and you have been sharing quite a lot of, of videos uh, with the community, which is fantastic. But you are also speaking with other people affected by epilepsy, professionals and others. Um, so we have already talked a little bit about epilepsy sparks, uh, but what is really the, uh, yeah, the mission uh, that you're on with, with epilepsy sparks? What do you really want to achieve with this work? Um, and Maybe you have already received some, some. I think, I think already some feedback so far has been the many thousands of subscribers that you have, the, the lot of attention that you get from from your videos. But what's really, what's what's drive, what's what's getting you up in the morning, uh, mm -hmm. except from maybe waking up from uh, from your boyfriend or so, getting getting to work. But what's really, <laughs> what's really the mission behind epilepsy, epilepsy sparks? It's about, as cheesy as this is gonna sound, right? It's about empowering people through education because like I'm likely to have epilepsy for the rest of my life. It's way better than it was, by the way, just so everyone knows, post-surgery. But what gets me out of bed and what keeps me going is knowing that the work that I'm doing has a positive impact on other people. Um, well, hopefully, <laughs> um, and that, you know, the way I look at things is that 
sometimes we have to be accepting that at the moment there's lots for lots of us our, our epilepsy will not be fully controlled lots of people yes it will which is fantastic but for those of us for whom it, it won't be fully controlled okay how, how do we make our lives better around that and for me and I think for lots of people that I've met it's about understanding what's going on in your head as much as possible if you forget what you've read you can read it again on the website memory awful um you can uh then you know how to talk about it more confidently with other people and that is a huge thing for so many of us it certainly was for me um growing up um, it's like, how do you flip and talk about this? Because people just don't get it. And and it's okay if they don't get it, but we just don't want people to have a bad reaction when they find out you have epilepsy or if you have a seizure in front of them, uh, you know? Um, and what really interesting... Um, may I also ask maybe... Um, oh, sorry. So um, I'm, you did the surgery, but in prior to the surgery and maybe, yeah, through the phases of your life, you have been experienced uh, seizures. Uh, mm -hmm. What type of seizures did you did you uh, have, and then maybe have has it changed after the surgery in any way? Um, so I always call my brain a bit of a drama queen. Like I like a bit of variety, right? So <laughs> when I was um, when I was a, um, like really little at primary school, I was having I would I was having uh, focal seizures. Um, and absences and I remember uh, the first seizure I remember I was at school and I was getting changed after um, sports PE whatever you call it and then I started walking down the hallway in just my underwear and almost walked into the classroom in just my underwear um, so this was yeah so the fact that I remember it but the fact that I wasn't kind of in control of what I do I mean I only had partial awareness and I put my hand on the door I was like Gonna walk in. Oh, now I came out of it. Thank goodness. Can you imagine how that would have impacted my life? Mm -hmm. um, and then, so I was having seizures like that. Um, my parents noticed, and this was when I was sent to the doc, um, me having an absence in the car. Um, and uh, the most, the first more severe seizure I remember, I was uh, skiing in um, Switzerland. I, I think I was about fourteen or something, and it was likely to be my first tonic clonic because I fell off the skis and fell asleep in the snow afterwards. Wow. Yeah. And luckily I was only doing training skiing at the time. So it wasn't in a dangerous place, but, and I was like, Oh, it's quite comfortable. Woke up all nice and warm in the snow and carried on. Um, anyway, and things got worse and worse. The older I got, um, the drugs weren't working. I started having more and more tonic clonic seizures. I would have clusters of seizures. I fell on a railway line, I um, fell off my bike into the middle of the road, I smashed my left cle left clavicle at work, needed two surgeries, um, but I was stubborn, so I just kept trying to go on with things. Um, but all the while, this isn't just seizures, this is rather depressing, this is rather anxiety inducing, this is like, I don't fit in in the world. I want to try and achieve whatever I'm supposed to achieve, um, you know, meet expectations of family and stuff like this. And, and just general society makes you think you have to do this to be a success. Mm -hmm. But when you're having seizures, it's quite difficult to do that. Now I know that, what you know, one shouldn't have to live up to other people's expectations, but you feel it, especially growing up. I still feel it today, but not in the same way. Sorry, what so, was your <laughs> yeah. so, so just to our, our viewers, um, the upsound seizures are, um, yeah, typically very brief, uh, loss of consciousness, or for example, at school, um, those having upsound seizures, children having upsound seizures, they typically yeah, so now for some some few seconds, um, but obviously uh, it also has a big impact um, in the sense that they might uh, lose out on the explanation coming from the teachers, yeah. or yeah, the conversation with your classmates might be very odd because they suddenly will, or they do like Tori, uh, <laughs> uh, almost walk into the classroom in the, in in, uh, in the underwear. No, but um, it has. <laughs> Like, hasn't it even though obviously convulsive and tonic clonic seizures then are more how to say 
uh, very visual to, to people around you. Like, yeah. how do you explain like upsound seizures and then the yeah the focal seizures to others? Like, how how did you put yeah put it out in words? Well, what's the thing is, and this is actually a good example, I think, of many people who do experience absence seizures, is that a lot of the time you don't even know you've had one. Mm -hmm. You'll just afterwards know that I feel weird or just not with it, or people might. But do you know what happened a lot with me at school was that I just didn't, I felt just like I was really, really slow. I, I can't remember what they said, things, I couldn't add things up together. And what's interesting now I never explained this to my neurologist at the time because I wasn't didn't know so much about epilepsy back then but the fact that I can't remember these things is not I imagine it's probably not just down to the drugs that I was taking because of course they've got a bad impact on your memory and, and cognitive function um, a lot of the time but it's that I was possibly having more seizure uh, absence seizures than I knew so I would have like I have a great friend, her name's Louise, who would sit next to me in class and I was like, What's happened? Like, or could you just give me the details of this? I just don't I just don't get it. And it might be wrong, I might have just not been with it. I, I don't know, but I just in retrospect think I was probably having more absences than I was aware of at the time. Um yeah. And that's the interesting thing about epilepsy as well. You, you just don't know half the time what is happening. I wish that I'd know. And this is one of the things I really actually like about EpiHunter is that I can imagine if I'd have been wearing it at the time, I would have had more information about what was going on in my head, in my brain, right? And even if, for instance, the EpiHunter had said, actually, do you know what? You're not having absence seizures right now. I'll be like, okay, cool. Then what is going on? So either way, it would have been good to know right and then it would have also been very useful information for my neurologist yeah because that's also, yeah of course very very core that the yeah from all the uh yeah the complaints and seizures and of course the side effects that you experience from from the medicine um yeah. the communication and and uh, you know that that important follow-up with your consultant or your physician as such uh, it's so, so important for, for our community as well and the families uh, and individuals that we are speaking with. Um, do you have any, because um, I can almost feel it like you, you are probably driving those conversations forward uh, with, with all your knowledge uh, from epilepsy and uh, studies that are ongoing, the labs and all the new stuff. Uh, do you have any tips to prepare for their uh, appointments or for their neurologists or yeah, they're all just appointments. Like how, how can they get the most out of, of that conversation? I would say, um, and this is for the person with epilepsy as well as um, the person they might go to the appointment with, is don't get ready for your appointment just before the appointment. Collate as much information as you can prior. Um, so hopefully you'd have some sort of diary of your seizures, whether that's, it can be written or it can be on your phone or whatever. Um, it's important to note that as important as that is, it's if, if say for instance, I'm, I'm doing a diary now, I, I don't trust myself 100% that I'm gonna catch everything because you don't half the time, say you're having seizures, you don't a lot of the time know that you've had a seizure. Mm -hmm. So just think, okay, how else can I collate information? Could it be from people who've seen you have a seizure? That would be really useful information too. If of course you had data that have been you know um collected from epi hunter or anything else like that that would be really useful too don't um underestimate the um importance of things like sleep diaries so important um when and, and the reason that things like this are so important is we see patterns um so or, or the neurologists should see patterns. Often it's hard for us to do ourselves because, <laughs> well, not just because of the epilepsy or like a lot of the time, quite frankly, people feel a bit off their face. We're not quite with it for the several different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so just get all the information you can together. If you've forgotten your pills, write it down. When did you take the pills when you'd forgotten, if there was time to do so? Um, has there even been any change um, in your personality? Um, that's really important. 
because it could be a side effect of the drugs. It could be a um, illness that comes along with the epilepsy. Um, it could be a side effect of, for instance, your depression or anxiety, if you have anything like that as well. Um, all of that is important. So if you're not sure if something might be important for your doctor, don't worry, just bring it along as well. Um, I would say also any other medical issues at all. So um, if you want to, what I do is I'm really, really over the top with filing because I know that my memory is so pants. So when I need to bring anything to the doctor, I can find it straight away. I like this filing cabinet. It's like literally this tall like this and it goes back years. And I think most people wouldn't do that. But for me, it gives me some reassurance. I can find everything really easily. I've got a separate um, file for, actually there's three of them now because I've collated all so much information over my life for epilepsy, two for mental illness, um, other ones for for um, like ambulance journeys that I've had, um, things uh, relating to um, menstruational periods because that's another thing for women. Um, sometimes, more often than many people realize, like your epilepsy can be impacted by your hormones and stuff. That's a different, and so all these type of things, collate all this information and take it along. I used to go to um, appointments with my neurologist on my own, the vast majority of the time, and I would just bring along all the information that I could, and then it is their responsibility as a doctor to um, put all this together and get a better overall picture. Yeah. yeah, that's some very, very handy uh, tips uh, for for those watching. Um, and also, I believe with the pandemic, uh, a lot of these appointments have been made remote anyway. So the importance of, of being prepared and, yeah, you know, being able to get as much as possible out of this uh, probably short conversation over phone or video is, is yeah, more than ever maybe uh, important. but. Regardless of this, uh, those tips will be for sure helpful also afterwards, uh, after the corona uh, pandemic. Um, well, sorry to interrupt, but I could you could say that you could scan that information and ping it over to your neurologist. You don't have to hold back. So if you're able, and if you don't have like a proper like professional scanner, can you take a picture of it on your phone? So there are many ways you can get around that. You don't have to wait until after you know, the pandemic is over, because let's face it, we might have another cycle of, of the virus. So yeah, you don't have to wait. No, absolutely. And of course, if you are using tools like EpiHunter or other uh, yeah. seizure diaries, which, which will help you, uh, hopefully, um, as EpiHunter, uh, you will be able to share that data anyway, directly with your consultant. So that's indeed very, very important as well, together with all the other observations and, and notes. And uh, yeah, um, maybe finally, Tori, how can people find epilepsy, epilepsy Sparks and how can people reach out to you either with their stories or with their research or maybe just someone from the general public interested to learn more about epi Epilepsy Sparks and epilepsy? How, how can we yeah, get in touch with you and, and uh, your organization? So Epilepsy Sparks is epilepsysparks.com and um, yeah, please just come look at the website um, and you can check our blog, you can check yeah, the last pages. We've got a crazy number of pages now. <laughs> Over this uh, period of time, I've been thinking of all these different ideas. We've got a page now for people where um, epilepsy is more, much more common. So if you've got Down syndrome, if you've got certain dementia, autism, things like this. Um, and if you want to find me on social media, I'm on Twitter, uh, Tori Robinson 10. Um, I'm on uh, Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Instagram, but I'm not on there very often. And also, I've got my own website, which is ToriRobinson.com, which has got a bit more information about uh, my experience and what I'm going through now and why I do public speaking about this, because I've got nothing to be ashamed of. The same with everybody affected by epilepsy and other people should not be ashamed to ask questions um and instead this whole epilepsy palaver which is just so awful but you will be amazed at the inspiring people from around the world that you can meet who are also affected by epilepsy and in addition 
you'll find that there are so many medical professionals and science professionals, such as neurologists, epileptologists, neuroscientists, um, organizations like EpiHunter, you'll meet people who really care. They really actually do care about you um, and they really wanna make a difference. Um, and that is that sort of uplifting feeling that we need a lot of the time. And I guess that's a sort of really nice thing to end on, isn't it? That you have people out there who care um, even if your epilepsy is doing your head in, just remember that, that you are not forgotten and that there is hope for the future. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very true. And also uh, the feedback we get from our families is that um, maybe even if they are not the most active on the social platforms, going out there, um, following a little bit on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, Visiting website to, to find more information is, is so important. And indeed, on the social channels, you will see people uh, out there with epilepsy, with same experiences. And again, Facebook groups. Um, so I just want to very quickly mention the EpiHunter support and chat group, where you really can come together and uh, yeah, learn from each other's experience. experience. Um, these kind of, of things, and maybe even more now than ever, are so important to, to keep up the mood and, and to get yeah get through all this. But I think on a final note, um, being liked or being positive about it and trying to to see the humor at times in, in epilepsy as well um, is is also a very very uh, important learning. So thank you so much Tori for joining us uh, again people feel free to uh, visit Tori's website epilepsysparks.com we actually have an interview there uh, with uh, with Tim the CEO yeah. of uh, it's his personal story as well uh, is found uh, on your website Tori so that's also a nice little read uh, but finally thank you for joining and I wish you all the best uh, I hope that the summer is also at least for some days or weeks coming coming to the UK. Uh, and yeah, it'll be nice. Look, I'm, yeah. I can, it's almost already here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that you can enjoy uh, the warmth uh, and the time with your loved ones. And hopefully the pandemic is also, uh, yeah, things are going a bit more back to normal. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll speak to you soon again. Thank you for having me. Take care. Speak to you later.